Welcome to yet another day that I thought would never come. I have to say with how this still young decade is going, my list of games that I thought I would never lay hands on is getting pretty short. And added to the, or removed from that list I should say today, actually late last night in my time zone, is Castlevania Resurrection, the cancelled Castlevania game for Sega Dreamcast. Now first of all I would like to thank the disc owner Arden for uploading this disc, and also for music composer Mark Lindsay, not only for letting me use his music in this video, but also for several other things, I'll go into that shortly. And finally, for uh, French Dreamcast scene site Dreamcast Info for doing the actual upload and making a number of different images for use on emulators or for burning on discs to play on actual Dreamcasts. Before I can get into the really fun stuff that you know I'm here for, of analyzing what's here in this demo, and speculating about what might have been, I do want to just hopefully close the book, at least for my statements, on the drama involved in the process of this demo being uploaded to the internet. Now, I've since my last video, I've talked to Mark Lindsay. We, we've totally made up, we're good, you know, it's things are good between us, he was totally cool with me using his music in this video. But I want to just go further than that to say anybody, you know, who has any sort of hard feelings about the process of how this demo eventually made it to the internet, I would encourage you to move past it, you know, I apologize if you can, if you said anything, you know, it went a little too far. I I've done so with Mark, and I also admitted it to him, something I didn't bring up in my last video and didn't want to say until I actually talked to him, but that I, my, my you know, where I was coming from was actually that I suspected him of having a stack of these demo discs over the years and that he's been selling them and that, you know, all of this was a scam. It was, you know, the classic pawn shop grift when you've got the, you know, the art stolen by Nazis in World War II of go in, tell the legend, raise the hint of notoriety so that they have to buy it from you out in the parking lot for cash and there's no record and you know you can get out of it scot-free without any record of having had it that was totally what i suspected him of and yes i'm a very paranoid person but you know if you're a preservationist and a fan of konami games it can make you a pretty jaded and suspicious person so i just that's all i have to say in my defense and that i you know i love conspiracies and that kind of stuff but after talking to him i'm totally convinced that that is not at all the case he was really cool about it we had a great laugh and you know i apologize and said hey man I, i'm sorry for trying so hard to provoke you it was because i thought you were trying to scam us all and you know we had a great laugh and he was like yeah you know i would i would never do that but if i were an immoral person that would have been a great scam if I would have grabbed a stack of those from the office, you know, and I'd, I'd have more money in my pocket. So yeah, I'm totally convinced that's not at all anything that happened, and really after, you know, hearing from Mark and hearing about his conversation with Arden, I genuinely believe that they just did not expect how people would react to this, that at best people would think that all this drama would just result in us not seeing the game. And at worst, some of us suspected that maybe they were trying to run some sort of grift here to do a high dollar private sale. So let's all just try to move on. And further than that, um, there, there were other people making comments about saying, oh, you know, I'm going to report these guys for fraud on eBay. And I know Arden has had some trouble with eBay. I mean, at this point, everything should be good with everyone. So if you're one of those people, you know, try to withdraw those. Just basically don't give these guys a hard time any further. Justice has been done. It, you know, in every sense, the disc is uploaded. And I genuinely believe that they just did not, you know, see, expect how people would react and just stepped in it like we sometimes all do. And yeah, th things are good between those of us involved. I would encourage you, any of you out there in the community that have any suspicions about this process or hard feelings because it didn't just, you know, immediately get offered to the preservation scene. Let's all just move on. And now let's get into the fun of analyzing this thing now that I've finally got it in my hands. As far as what's actually contained within the demo, there are five stages. Courtyard, stairs, hall, corridor, and chapel. Now, as it says on the front of the disc on original Dreamcast hardware, the corridor area cannot be loaded, but all the others can be played 
just fine on a Dreamcast, and all of them can be loaded on an emulator. I used ReDream for that reason and to get 1080p footage for this video. Now an interesting thing about this is originally these were put together as a demo that appeared to be completable from start to finish. They all tie one into another. But in this build it seems to be a little after that demo and it is either difficult to get the area transitions to trigger or some areas you cannot load into the next area at all because you're blocked from getting into the entrance that would trigger the animation of loading the next area. Now I suspect that this is actually because they were working on implementing chunking. Chunking is a technique that's a precursor to our modern data streaming that allows games to have large worlds without constant loading screens. This was introduced by Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time and Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver in the 12 month period before that this game had been being developed. And so I would imagine that the team was trying to use uh, what's called chunking, where you load in one chunk of the game at a time, and when, usually when you go through a door is the method used by both Zelda and Soul Reaver. It unloads the previous area and loads the next one. And that is why I suspect that they, it appears that they were messing with those transitions, is because that was a way to work with the you know limited video memory and everything else of the Dreamcast, but that is just speculation. This demo gives us access to Sonya Belmont, one of the two characters that were intended to be in the final game, and she has the classic vampire killer whip as her main weapon, and five sub-weapons you're able to collect throughout the demo. Now these include four of the classic weapons, the knife, axe, holy book or bible, and the holy water or potion, it's been called a number of non-religious names over the years, but those you should be pretty familiar with and they work very much like they do in other Castlevania games. But also included is the boomerang, which I had the most fun with. Now the boomerang has been included in a few Castlevania games in the past, I'm not sure if this would have actually been the first one, but it's a less common one, but I had a lot of fun with it. It works like the knife, but it comes back and hits things on the way back. And come on, if you've ever played Ty of the Tasmanian Tiger, throwing boomerangs is fun. But I really, you know, enjoyed the sub-weapons. I thought they worked pretty well. Now there's not a targeting system. There is a slight auto-targeting, but it works much like Fantasy Star Online, where you have to kind of aim yourself. And, but once you're basically pointed at things, it works pretty well. It's fairly similar to how things work in Castlevania 64, but I have to honestly say that like a few other things I'm going to mention, it actually feels like they've taken some steps in the right direction. It would be nice to see a visible reticle and to be able to do some sort of Z-targeting, but the way your whip actually targets and the sub-weapons target when you're pointed at an enemy works significantly better than Castlevania 64, in my opinion. But I'll get more into those comparisons and things later. As far as what's actually included, there's only one boss battle of Medusa at the end, and then there's a sort of chase sequence with this giant Hydra monster through a hallway. That's the level that's not able to be loaded on a Dreamcast. But it, it definitely it feels a little rough, especially that sequence, but a lot of what's here it, it either is fun or could easily be made fun with minimal work, and that was pretty much my experience going through it. The visual presentation is very impressive in my opinion, for 1999 especially. Now I think a lot of people are going to look at this and have a hard time remembering what was around back then, but for the capabilities of the Dreamcast, this is some of the most impressive texture work, if not the most impressive texture work I've seen. And I can see why they were struggling with texture memory and why they might have been implementing chunking, as I suspect, because running all of these really, really high resolution textures that are absolutely gorgeous is, you know, it's going to use up your texture memory budget very quickly and you'd have to use very small chunks like this. And it, it would be a bit of a trick to get it all strung together. You can see that they're struggling. Some enemies load in a little too close to you and they were obviously tweaking that at this time, but if they could have made it work, this would have easily been remembered as one of the best looking Dreamcast games, if not the best looking Dreamcast game. Now, as far as when it comes to the music, there's only one 30 second clip that repeats over and over again in this demo, which is kind of funny considering all the discussion. So I've included more of Mark Lindsay's soundtrack here, and I'm just gonna shut up and show you some of this awesome level design and texturing and also a few of the character models, and let you listen to some of his music since there's not much of it actually in this demo.
Now that I've shown off most of what's in this demo, we really get to my favorite part, which is the speculation about, you know, what could have been, and really evaluating, at least in my opinion, should this game have been cancelled? And for me, I have to say that's a resounding no. From what I'm seeing here, there's a lot of promising stuff that was pretty cutting edge to what a lot of people were doing on the Dreamcast, and even if they were going to port the game to the PlayStation 2, it, a lot of these textures and a lot of this work would have looked and worked just fine on the PS2, so to me this looks like a game that honestly had promise and what it needed was more resources. Now we will never know truly what goes on inside Konami, but their actions definitely make us wonder. And when this was, basically when everyone was canned at Konami USA and the assets of this game were handed over to the Japanese team, they basically said there was nothing of value and they tossed it all out. And I have to say that I'm a little skeptical of that because some of the changes to the targeting and how the camera systems work that I can see right here in this demo look very similar to the iterations on the systems in Castlevania 64 as they appear in Lament of Innocence on PS2. So I honestly, just based on you know how badly we all think of Konami and the fact that it's looked like this before, I honestly think this is another one of those of Konami's Japanese team absolutely hates it when their US employees outdo them at anything. And I think this game would have definitely been a strong improvement on Castlevania 64 and you know much like we've suspected in the past where they started beef for seemingly no reason with voice actors like David Hayter and a lot of us have just kind of been like you know what you guys are just mad that everyone likes him better than the Japanese voice actor and I gotta say that I mean after years of this it really does start to feel like that that anytime Konami's US employees come up with something impressive they're like oh no 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 you can't look good and you really can't ever make us look bad you know what you're all fired so yeah I mean I've already exposed that I'm quite a bit of a cynic coming into this video but yeah sure this is rough this is a rough build there was a lot of work left to be done but nobody else was getting textures that look this detailed and this many of them in an area on the Dreamcast, and I've tested this on original hardware as well, and it, you know, it runs pretty well. It's rough in a number of parts, but it really feels like there's a lot of promise that honestly was wasted. And you know, when you look at like the textures don't look this good in Lament of Innocence, it also uses small chunks and it looks kind of generic and ugly, whereas a lot of these levels are they're fairly gorgeous, and they honestly put Castlevania 64 and Lament of Innocence and Curse of Darkness to shame. And if this had been the direction that 3D Castlevania had gone, I honestly think it would have been better. Now that may be an unpopular opinion. I can see the internet just jumping on this and being like, oh, it sucks just like Castlevania 64. 3D Castlevania will always suck no matter what. But I mean, in my opinion, if you gave more resources to a team working on this, we could have had a game that was significantly better than the other 3D Castlevanias that we've seen. It could just be that, you know, I've been waiting for this so long, I'm a huge fan, I've been obsessed with it for years, the Dreamcast is one of my very favorite systems, if not my very favorite, Castlevania one of my favorite series, so of course I'd always want more games, but I honestly, I really feel like this should not have been cancelled and would have been a fantastic game, and I really wish we would have had it back on the Dreamcast.